Thank you so much for coming out to the Wayland Library to hear our three fabulous poets. Uh, I'm Courtney, I work here, and I just have two pieces of information that are blanking in my head. If you're joining us via Zoom um, and you have questions or comments at the end, just put them in the chat and I will read them aloud so that everyone can hear them. And also to let you know that in two weeks, on October 15th, uh, we have a new director which will, and we'll be celebrating in this very space at two o'clock. So you're all invited for Kate and music in March. And now I'll hand it over to Diane. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And um, actually, we give you a lot of thanks for helping us organize this and providing us this wonderful facility to share our words. I'm Diane Silvestri, and this is Linda Lomenza, and here is Margo Lazansky. Uh, together with them, I welcome all of you, and I'm so thrilled to see all of you. Um, we look forward to a period of questions and discussion afterwards, so be prepared for that. Not so long ago, Margot, Linda, and I were each struck with a medical disaster. Each of us rode our way out of the calamity, and later, as we listened to each other's poems, we notice a synergy between them. Today, we will be reading our pieces in four sections to correspond with what seem to be stages in our progress towards healing. Linda gets to begin with part one, mm -hmm. an abrupt traumatic event. Several years ago, I'm a little scratchy, sorry. <laughs> Several years ago on a bone dry day in July, I stopped for some water at a gas station and my plans changed abruptly. I was hit by a mini SUV and as a result began a long recovery process involving surgery and rehab. My right side sustained the brunt of the injuries. My right arm was shattered and my right foot also sustained some damage. I needed to learn how to do things like brushing my teeth combing my hair, and eventually writing with my left hand. This book, Left-Handed Poetry, is the result of dictation into my phone and wobbly left-handed print. During this blessed period of my life, I healed and wrote and healed and wrote. From Rainbows. You see one? You must turn your back to the sun. There must be rain in another part of the sky, each drop lit by the sun's white menu, and a secondary luminosity trapped inside the rain, twice reflecting, reversing order, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, an ordinary rainbow memorized in primary school. To miss it, your back must be flat on the hospital bed, curtains drawn, outside world notwithstanding. Linda Pilot. Truth is the purple swollen disaster of my foot where her tire wrecked me in the mobile parking lot. My right elbow, a shattered bone, I can no longer lean on. Now I'm part of her SUV, my DNA forever embedded in her bumper. <clears throat> Sunset in the ER. My reflection fades from the stainless steel IV pole, wet with tears. They wheel me onto a gurney, past my name and birth date, but I don't know. My body's covered in a blanket that sears my skin and limbs. I know I'm in trouble, staring at the ceiling, waiting for anyone to tell me who I am. Although my entire life I've enjoyed reading and writing poetry, in college I changed my major to pre-med to become a physician. For many decades, I practiced in dermatology at UMass Medical School. 
Then in March 2014, my career was interrupted when I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and given a 10% chance of survival. I wrote each day through the torment of chemotherapy and later through the alien experience of receiving a bone marrow transplant. My months of recovery stretched into years as I dealt with complications, including graft versus host disease and serious infections because of my immunosuppression. My journal fueled the poems that helped me understand my feelings and find some identity and purpose to continue after all that I had lost. Many of these poems uh, became my recent book, but I still have my fingerprints, which is available after. My story begins with poem number one. Emergency call, phone call from my doctor, 11 p.m. Your chest x-ray was normal, but you have almost no white blood cells. Through Encore ER appraisals, enclosed and exposed by scraping metal curtain rings, I endure to the verdict at dawn. They belt me to a gurney to jolt into an ambulance vault where six spotlights grill through me from the quilted stainless steel ceiling. During transfer, the uniformed man taps a clipboard makes small talk, but the surreal all-nighter has grown thinker. He swirls my cart through corridors, triggers open automatic doors, and rolls me under the banner, announcing my unthinkable deposit on the seventh floor tower of New Phoenix. Once the diagnosis was established, I began chemotherapy, of course, and a notorious uh, chemo agent is the bright red Dono Rubicin, which is the title of the next form. You save lives, you take them. Your methods I memorized from the thick blue textbook, a cruelty still vivid. Your Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, but I have no choice. My tears cannot bargain. I clutch my son's hand, thank God for mercy, and at the nurse clocks her foot and a big barrel plunger to send your scourge tunneling at my core to assassinate all proliferating cells. Oh, crimson savage, Leave me alive. And I had a near-death experience a few years ago. Emergency heart surgery for a burst aorta. And after surgery, a medically induced coma for a week and then weeks of rehab. <laughs> I was very lucky to survive intact. But I had to learn to walk again, climb stairs, make breakfast. I was afraid I couldn't write anymore. <laughs> With the support of an occupational therapist who came to my house and said, write, and watched me, I picked up my pen and wrote myself through healing. Writing and healing were one. My chapbook, Wild for Life, is a memoir of my healing in poems. They're available after. To my aorta, you failed me. No warning. Three layers strong, carrying blood to every part of me. Oxygen fast riding like microscopic submarines. No low tide until you tore and blood surged, not through to your outer layer, the lucky path of the surge, buying time for an army to pump blood into me to save my life. 
I don't know if I can trust you to tell me. You're patched with dacron. The cardiac surgeon stitched by the seamstress induced a long sleep to give you room to settle. Time enough for death to lose interest in me. <laughs> All the changes at evening. String of cars on the bridge, halos from the street lights. Night things have their time. I don't want the dark in rehab. When the big shade draws down, semi-opaque, worked with a switch, I start counting the hours. At half past five, the sunlight begins, touching the cables, the tugboats, unless fog closes the whole landscape, making me shut in and very small. If it were all right just to love and die, I wouldn't be in this place setting stories up. Thank God for the harbor and the barges my husband loves to watch. Morning has come. Still gray, but morning enough. It was a good night. I didn't get hungry, didn't need roasted nuts, didn't toss and turn after a trip to the bathroom. I sip a big mug of foamy hot chocolate because coffee doesn't suit me these days. My first memory is moaning, no last. Completely cared for, I yielded everything. My husband pointed out the USS Constitution in the harbor and the dawn touching the Zaken Bridge. I didn't care about any of it. For weeks, I didn't see beauty at sunrise, didn't feel pain, didn't move my body for hours. I tried to find myself in my syrupy brain, tried to read, to write, trying to understand. The next section is about the challenges of our physical recovery. Um, a sort of taking stock of what's left. <clears throat> Left-handed poetry. Two weeks post-surgery, episode of Breaking Bad briefly holds my attention. Extra large cucumber shows up in the garden. My sister gives me a shimmering tattoo of a mermaid in honor of her birthday. Oliver Sacks dies on August 30th while I'm reading his biography. I create a plan for the first day of school, though I won't be teaching. I pretend to go see the new Mission Impossible movie, Rogue Nation. Dog retrieves his lost chew toy from under the sofa. I FaceTime with Madeline, repair pains and pastimes, while the ink black scab on my elbow flakes off. I practice printing with my left hand. Atomic number 22, titanium. From the Greek word titans, used in the aerospace industry, airframes, engines, screw blades on ships, light frames that withstand extreme temperatures, strong as steel, only lighter, found in meteorites and the sun, only element that burns in pure nitrogen. High strength, toughness, corrosion resistant, wedding rings, low density money clips, artists paints, my reconstructed elbow. My world was turned upside down. This next poem is <clears throat> Doctor and Patient. In medical school, we all imagined catching infirmities as we learned them. Addison's mixedema, a brain tumor from every headache. <laughs> I'm now awkwardly beached, my white coat surrender, modesty breached by the gaping extra large blue gown as students filed in. 
I agree to be their mannequin. Let them interview me, palpate, percuss, smile, survey, and auscultate me because I recall my young stethoscope on early test runs. Now ripped from my role as teaching physician, I have become a teaching case, naked in a snow globe. The room, the first month, isolation room, was often lonely, but I made a friend. This is my poem for George. I've named this special IV called George, my constant companion in empty hours in chemo and the eternal waiting. He tirelessly suspends fluid for rooms and supports pumps that purr and sizzle like dizzy bees, pushing mysteries into me. George is strong to steady my step and sometimes winks his glee at my glee. He doesn't object if I push him away when I need some space. Mm -hmm. Infrequently, his tires run over accidentally the three trailing tubes that hitch us together. He tries to fit his six wheel stance. He said, well, when you're not that, He's become a friend, even if twice he nicked my ankle. <laughs> but I understand. My anger slips out sometimes too quickly. Mm -hmm. Something less than beauty. When I finally woke up, I saw that they had taken me apart and put me back on the mm -hmm. I was limp as a hooked fish and bulging in new places. Nurses held my hands and took her off the steps. My feet wouldn't go what I wanted. I went back to stairs, each one a little mountain. I hoped my leg would lose its numbness where the tube had been, that my belly would return, and I'd spring up from my chair like I used to. I was hungry and couldn't eat. The food ground up, bland, gray, gray. I wouldn't sleep with my mind empty and expectant, not needing to check the clock at 3 a.m. You circled me, watched over me, your presence there asking, are you all right? What can I say when you tell me how much you love me? Last rates were offered. My husband buries his head in the wind, says he wants me back, the old me, doing five things at once. He wants to obliterate the details of my collapse, and yet he recites the catalog over and over, the lonely drive behind the ambulance at 4 a.m. The emergency room offered to call the priest for last rates. He refused. And home now, I do one thing at once. Dress more slowly as the woman I was. Put on one earring and the other a pearl necklace. Ask him to help me with the class. I take a silk scarf from the shelf, comb my hair in the mirror, examine my scar and below the heart monitor attached to my chest. Maybe he can't see me finishing one task before I start another, pulling the milk before I scramble the eggs. I might always be wary. Next part, we will talk about change and healing, um, our stops and starts and setbacks. The summer that wasn't. In Tuscany, we sip wine. 
walk the countryside. The vineyard like crusty bread, frescoes in churches, no overflowing bed pans, no red popsicles, no shooting pain. I selected the villa months ago because it has a ping pong table for the girls and a second level porch to view the stars. I imagined buying pesca with Anna, eating grapes with Ellery, sharing a kiss with Paula, my best, on the terrazzo. Our first family vacation, the four of us. But I'm broken, and the three of them sick. Anna sick of folding summer into the transitional care unit. Ellery sick of tasting my hospital pot pie. Best sick of doing it all solo. My pillows, my ice packs, my home. I readjust my shattered arm. Turn on the people's court. Best says, we're canceling. I say, go without me. You need the break. The Baltimore Therapeutic Equipment Work Simulator. <laughs> no. Baltimore Therapeutic Equipment Work Simulator. Each week, I visit OT, sit at the machine, grasp the steel wheel, tilted like a real steering wheel, pretend to drive because I can't ever since pain put me in slow motion. And turning and turning in circles like my three-year-old self at Ride Playland, a tiny car on a track, happily spinning, never really going anywhere. Over to the commode. <laughs> you collect dust in the bathroom. I haven't used you in a month. It's an unspoken agreement between me and your monstrosity. You will stay there until this whole thing is over with. Bear witness to each stabbing shower I take until we're sure we don't need each other anymore. The chemotherapy I received put me into a remission, but my doctor said uh, it would not stay and recommended I have a bone marrow transplant. Yeah. That led to a search for a match. I had one sister, this poem uh, refers to her in Donor Search. My sister and I used to play, we were teachers recording grades or secretaries, filing or mothers tending babies and frying rubber eggs. <laughs> or clerks bringing grocery sales to each other on a red plastic cash register. I held her hand to cross the driveway to Sylvia's house or the neighbor boys. She taught me all she learned in school. We sat wedged on the bench of piano duets. I hesitate to phone her now. Don't want to tell her the results disclose she cannot be my narrow donor. Like piano keys, the black and white stripes on her chromosome number six are an exact match of mine, except for a single rare ship in the embryo of one of us. The good news is. In the registry, a tenor of the end donor, unrelated, is found. Um, and the next poem I wrote uh, during the adjustment to figuring out what was going on with that ending. This poem is entitled Chimera. Mm -hmm. The epigraph is from the dictionary. Chimera, no, number one. Or an organism with tissues of diverse genetic composition. Two, a fanciful or new invincible idea. <clears throat> There's a man in my life, nesting in caverns in my bones, pulsing his excursions and navigating forks in my veins almost as if he owns them. 
blood in there, I call mine. But it spells where his signature. I pray this union will work, but worry about a mutant. I must find a way to persuade the new guy to be my ally. God help the two of me to get along. <laughs> And eventually, I did get out of the hospital. This was one event soon after. Choosing the right punk farm stand made it Massachusetts. You there, you are the one. You moon face like those of us who have been taking too much prednisone for too long. Another scar across your forehead, dried abrasion, stubbling your chin. You are the wounded, strong soul. I will give you eyes to find me likewise. Temporary separation. I'm inside this body that doesn't work the way it did before, as if all my angles were piled then. Fear of falling makes me consider where I sit, where I step. Love is filling me up. Every day the children fall, a gift of sequined silk and flowers from my brother. You drive me every year, carry and lift. Nights are long. Street lights shining in through the curtains. In the drizzle, the neighborhood turned 19th century romantic. But the surgeon has separated us, as though I'm covered in the post office labels. Fragile, special hair. There's a big scar on my chest, and I'm afraid you might bang into me with your elbows and knees. I serve dinner by candlelight, hoping temporary separation. Mm -hmm. Three months out, hoping for something more. The night too hot and wet. Morning comes in the spaces between the leaves. My head is foggy, gently tangled as the leaves crisp and blow. Today, I could cry. Will I get any better, any stronger? I'm still awake from 2 to 4 a.m. and sometimes longer. My light is small and it bores me. The spirit leaf. I want to be tight with it, as tight as a tomato in the skin, so tight I could split. I want everything to have poems gush out of me, to cook dishes I gorge on, to walk on streets I've never walked, to dig for giant bombs that resist my rage, stay fast in their holes. An almost sour lifelessness comes over me, pins me to the chair, and when I raise myself to stand, my legs are heavy. When I walk the neighborhood, my knees drag me down, shouting, stop, stop. Each of us is a survivor in our own way. Our next section is about going on and finding survivorship. Four months later, I walk again. On my first walk, a short one, I pause to consider my greatest fear, acorns, hundreds of them, like landmines beneath my feet. I tread gingerly. Atop a pickup truck, a man showers grass seed across the berm, nods to me. The 
paddock on Bedford Road contains the horse, still wearing a tartan plaid blanket. His eyes search mine. In a clear plastic bag, a sandwich lies on the sidewalk, seems lonely. But I stand at the doorway to Mrs. Williams' house, peek in at her indoor rock garden. St. Francis' statue stands in ferns, urges me onward. Back to work. Inside my arm, pain circles round and waits like the old gray dumpster in the parking lot. Teaching reading keeps me tuned to mind and body, different now, metallic in places. My principal offers to carry my books, asks, am I tired, does it hurt? I am tired. I want slow, like the subtle growth of plants. Silence after each page turns. Got out a bit more, and this next poem is about um, a trip I took with my husband uh, for his conference. This is called With Feathers. The epigraph is taken from my hospital chart. The patient is at high risk of morbidity from medications, as well as her disease. In Montreal with my husband, I stroll Rue St. Catherine, startled as a sidewalk sleeper, flopping his hinged dusty hops the curb, while the still body of a white pigeon lies beat against the store's wall. Birds that bullet my kitchen windows may ricochet injured but usually snap up, ruffle, shrug off the stun, and fly, alive. Maybe one feather missing. I trouble over the on-duty doctor's words in his note about me. Morbidity sounds like mortality. That crimson M drags my neck when I'm trying so hard to fly. Mm. Still trying this poem is Victory Garden. In the glazed teal ceramic planter, my husband received from his best friend when I was near death. The burgeoning Diefenbachia beside the red veined prayer plant blanches three blades weekly. And when those leaves are rot, the blackening fingers of palm deeper in the jungle wither in ominous demise. Plants in general are harmless. I mean, after surviving five years, my husband's victory garden now threatens, and I feel I must keep us both alive for him. Letting go. It's the beginning of your letting go. You've been holding yourself together, waiting to know I'll survive. I wasn't there when you were most frightened, when you couldn't communicate with me at all. Now you're holding me on your lap in the big chair, my back to you, and I feel you crying. I know you're thinking about life without me. And it will happen, probably not this time, but it will. And one of us will have to find a way to go on. Time was, I had a limit to being held. I'd push you away and go on to the next thing. Today, there's only your holding me. Our eyes fill up. Mm -hmm. I must have been wild for life. I held fast to the tiniest bit, 
held on down to my very beginning. Because I felt no agonies, why was I not joyful? Why so quiet and so slow? Joy seizes the rising moon. Why wasn't I holding the other end? There's a black line on my chest, lumpy and scarred. The week of my coma, what was it? Absence or sleep? Memory does not assail me. It was only my heart beating. Was I in my body, deep inside, or had I left? I can't let it in all at once. Just a small portion of blue sky and a yellow flower whose name I don't know. Half the garden died while I was recovering, and the other half roots me stiff on it. I sit upright and watch the kind of TV that simply runs my mind. Was I supposed to have died? Did I? Was I brought back? I could have slipped it over so easily, the thin margin visible to me now. These are the final poems in each of our books. We'll then have some time for questions and discussion. Right away. If I could do it over, I would avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> the sea, the six car lot at the mobile station, Dunkin' Donuts inside. Skip the stop for water on that parched day. Skip pain, rehab, a view into life like an octogenarian, relearning to function on the left side. Would I bypass the pain? Revision is not knowing that for every trouble causer, the driver, there are two do-gooders, like the sisters from New Hampshire who dashed over to pick up my things, airborne at impact. Asked who they could call for me, said it will be okay, reminded me to breathe. The mini mart manager fetched ice and water. EMTs skillfully distracted me in the ambulance, cracking jokes about the traffic. My boss came to my home, rearranged the fridge so I could reach everything easily. Maybe I could have done without the ER doc who told me go home just before I fainted from the pain. But now I have empathy for medical personnel exhausted on inhumane shifts, unnoticing color drain from my face. The moment I tried to stand, empathy, like how African elephants grieve and mourn their dead, or how my dogs stood by the crate of the unwieldy dog we hosted in our home till he could be placed. My final poem is one of a few of several <laughs> metaphors that began to appear to me. Um, this is called New Life Takes Keep Colorado. Ravenous sky struck flames ripped the evergreen cloak from this mountain not long ago. Now, Gabriel draws me to range its meadow. Neil, Gather fragments of trunks, charred spicules, still tinged with smoke. I pack them home to loop pink and yellow ribbon through the scorched walls to spangle my Christmas tree and remind me of snow buttercups, scarlet paintbrush, silvery yuba emerging from the roads. Tonight, only poetry will serve after Adrian Rich. Only poetry will fly among the planets, the stars, the new moon, and my unconscious. Awakened from coma, there's a Chernobyl in my throat, I said, a metaphor on my tongue. Only poetry will stand me up on a scallop shell 
naked in my wavy hair while the nurses shower me, scrub my back, and I hold on, grateful to be upright, oblivious to everyone elsewhere, standing or not. And only poetry will pull me word by word by word to the table where I write verb, noun, participle, sometimes a reckless adjective. I am returned. <laughs> Thank you for being so. Thank you for an amazing audience. Now you get a chance to ask a question. So, did I ask before if there were some submitted so we can get this group started? Not yet. But okay. I'll plug them again. Does anyone hear that? Oh, there he goes. Eric. First of all, thank you all so much. And I don't know, it, it's kind of amazing to hear such different things um, that are all the same thing. So, but you really proved your point, whatever point you were trying to make, I think you made it. Um, how would this have been different if you were painters, let's say, instead of poets? Margot left home made me think that, like, what is it about poetry specifically that can unite and create? What, how would it have been different, I guess? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> poetry gave me a way through, a way out, a way back to the table. It was the only thing I wanted to do, and I was so afraid I couldn't do it. It was a return, too, for me. And I, I think, um, Maybe it's my uh, low IQ in art, but for me, I'm not sure I could appreciate um, the feeling being transmitted through the picture as well as I'm used to knowing it through words. So. I think um, that writing this book was, uh, was a journey um, and it I think it was the only way I could get through uh, this event. And um, I always say I'm better on paper than I am in person. <laughs> I'm a word person. So um, it meant everything to me to be able to process it in that manner. I, I should say I'm also a painter. And uh, I was worried that I was never going to paint again. But I did start. Well, it creeps into every poem I write. Okay. You know, I could write the whole poem, but it's going to be in the last one. <laughs> it's just, it's always there. Um, so for me, it's a um, thank my point of reference. Um, so this uh, experience changed my life and my writing. And um, my work now is, it's different. It's, um, yeah, it contains more in a smaller amount of space. Effects. I think one thing that was a commonality between us 
was that at, I think in the past, and maybe this is my answer for my future for right now, but um, we all found unfinished, if you will, uh, poems from the past that we had written in our, they were in our notes or whatever, that found their way to what we needed to say mm -hmm. as we were in recovery, which was just so enticing. Mm -hmm. Were you all writing poets in before your illnesses? What are your thoughts regarding uh, poetry as a vehicle for healing from someone who has not written poetry prior to the epic illness? Would it still help a novice? Would it still be? I think general, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'm a teacher, so um, my I'm leaning towards the yes. Everyone should do this. <laughs> and it was such a, um, an important way for me to process uh, the events and, and to get through it. So um, I think that anyone going through anything that writing would be you know, doesn't have to be a poem. Yeah. Just how it's been. And even writing writing a letter often helps someone who isn't a poet uh, find what's what they really need to say. And that's sort of what our poems, I think, sort of helped us find, you know, our anger, oh, or recognize, you know, or, or even express humor when like there's no place else in what's going on except in this poem. To say this is really bizarre, you know, uh, about something funny. A lot of them. What's your name? Yeah. Name your ID. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Judy. Well, I, my question is uh, I'm interested in to know uh, what poets do, like you said, that they enrich the you mentioned uh, or a specific poem that you uh, have found that. Fall back on to read some poet that you um, found particularly uh, helpful in your journey. I read uh, Christian Lyman when I was in the hospital because he has written a book when he went through a stem cell transplant for a very different instance than mine. And he's a very well known poet, was the editor of poetry for a while. And they're, they're a little bit um, esoteric, some of his books, but um, that's probably where I started. Uh, but more recently, um, I mean, I, I go back to my old favorites who are mostly contemporary poets, actually. Um, and they're probably not names you would know, but you know, I have their books. <laughs> um, yeah, I have, I have a few people, but um, contemporary poets are my favorite people who are still. So with us in writing, um, I like Ada Limon's stuff a lot, and um, Joel Corn Glass is someone else I really admire. Um, you know, if you're going, if you're going to go look at history, um, Emily Dickinson has always held a special place for me. So for me, there was any particular poet who, who helped me while I was writing. I was just doing it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, two uh, first, uh, going through all of your tragedies, how, as much as you wanted to be able to write, how difficult was it to actually go back and write about this, um, emotionally? <clears throat> And and how did it how did it affect you in your everyday life? Mm -hmm. I think um, the writing was easier because it was private than the reading. When I began the first readings, I was surprised because I would get choked up or you know I'd be back in the moment. Um, so the writing, I knew I could work it and you know uh and i was reading my journal which did bring back oh, oh. 
think um, I have a lot of vivid memories from that accident, as you know. And so um, it was traumatizing to write some of the work. It was um, it was hard to go back and um, remember uh, everything. But I, I think it was necessary too. Well, I was writing during the uh, the rehab, and I started writing. I'd only been home a couple of weeks, so it was you know a little over a month after this, yeah, the initial trauma. Uh, but now I find that um, I'm obsessed with the coma. I just can't understand how a person can lose a whole week. And I have any memory of it. I mean, it's not even just black, it's just nothing. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm struggling with trying to write about that. Mm -hmm. And that might come on for that. Mm -hmm. When did uh, that is, um, is what I asked um, Diane Linda, but is there anything that's so upset that you feel like? Less than experience and you just have kind of craft. It's interesting. I have different things like um since I um over that's some um imagery that doesn't go away. And and I've written some of it, but I don't think I've really actually gotten to that moment where a car rolls over my body. And I would like to do that. And you know, when you're done with your, your stuff, like I'm done with this, let's move it along, let's move on to the next topic. And I feel like I'm mostly finished with it, but not that one um, aspect. I still find that uh, some of the poems, poems that never graduated, you know, or got into <laughs> and sort of, um, those I probably still am struggling to get out when I need to get out. And those are uh, the ones that deal with love and joy. I mean, I I, um, I love reading a love poem that I think is a good love poem, but I'm not sure I've learned how to write it yet. I mean, for both Margot, well, all of us experienced, all of us actually experienced in some of the poems in the book, um, writing about what we missed uh, in intimacy, you know, with our partners. But um, but the actual, you know, the emotion of all of this, that I think it still grounds with being fear that I will lose it. <laughs> yeah. Final question? There must be. Yes. Um, I'm curious, you know, you obviously all broke through your experiences, and I'm wondering about the people surrounding you that loved you to do all of this. Were they doing the same thing to get through this as well? Or how did they cope with these traumatic events? So we over here, I could tell you. <laughs> My family just hung on to each other. My daughter um, kept a, an email list and she gave people updates on my progress. Well, they didn't know for a long time. Well, for a week or more, if I was going to be a vegetable, if I was going to have any lunch or something. So they just needed this waiting, this party for everybody. My son was still. Basements every single day from the West Coast after over four years. Uh, I can answer a little bit from the um, being my partner, her, uh, her daughter, um, her daughter, um, she was eight, nine years old, um, and she clung to her mother. She would not be the hospital. And it was there every hospital, any hospital, any second she could get there. My daughter um, was a lot younger, but got the gist of it as far as 
we grab you by Emerson Hospital saying, that's really good. How's it? It's great. You know, we live together. Um, and I mean, Linda's immediate family was amazing. Um, just coming over, sitting with her, cooking, you know, all the things, I think, um, just keeping her spirits up. Um, the epitome of, of a family. Um, it was very uh, um, the network in our family um, tightened up <clears throat> and, and from that mm -hmm. um, experience. Um, and I have such good friends too. I have such good friends and family. Just so lucky. Mm -hmm. My uh, my family was a supporter through a, a long haul um, during the leukemia. Uh, I mean, I don't know how they were processing so much as that they were doing um, they decorated my room, not only with the photos of the family, but every day I got a new word uh, like courage or, mm -hmm. you know, boy, did a wolf. some new word uh, that was you know, on color paper went on the door um, and just uh, calls and visits and um, helping me get out the carry bridge log I had. But, um, then later in the transplant room, I think I got sicker, and I've heard a bit about the fear when I almost ended up in the ICU. I mean, I know that was very hard for them. I have um, four kids and uh, a husband, two of the kids, and my husband are all physicians, so there was a lot of focus on information. You know, we all want to understand what's going on and whether everything was being done that should be done or, you know, was this, what caused this complication, things like that. So there was there was that, which um, then we had also the translation to the two that weren't in medicine, you know, which um, I, I saw all of that happen. So they were around me as well as a whole group of other friends around. Um, you know, I was going to say another thing about the support. Um, after going home, uh, the first hundred days after a transplant is the most critical when you just may not make it. That's the largest fall off of surviving. And uh, my kids got together, and my husband and my sisters in law, and so on, and wrote uh, 10 from the various ones, 10 um, encouragements or memories, fond memories, affirmations for me to receive each day. So I have a thousand gifts in this notebook of these, um, you know, 10 gifts a day for 100 days. Uh, and that was an amazing thing. They were relishing in memories from the past, which encouraged me, you know, that it was important I make it. Well, we could. Oh, are you ready to talk, Carol? You look like you're ready to talk. No, oh, okay. Final call. <laughs> and now um, we're going to go. The books are on sale. Marco's new book just out is also. Oh, you get it ready? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, all right. <laughs> so there are books on, on the table. Um, we don't. We aren't equipped to take. Um, you know cards and men and stuff like that. So we're, we're simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we will sign if you have books or want to buy books and want any of us to autograph them. So mine's not here yet, but um, I left a postcard for you in case you'd like to um, pre-order the book or get information that comes out in March. So please take that so that you can remember to get your hands off her book when you can order it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for watching.